We also wanted to uh, thank um, Francis and Chris Wood for coming out tonight, and Miss Erna Day, who is an early employee of the radio station, and of course, Mr. Henry Fulcher here uh, for coming out tonight, um, and hopefully we can get them to share some of their memories of the radio station. All right, with no further ado, our president, Jim Eric. I want to thank Larry for bringing his mom over tonight. Uh, let me pull up a chair. Welcome everybody here tonight and uh, kind of just tell you where we're coming from. When WFLO closed out in December, there were a lot of uh, items that were put into the archives over at Longwood. And um, we've been sorting through them. Uh, we're getting them. We got almost 900 photographs scanned and they're going to be available online as soon as Benedict can get us hooked up online over at Longwood. And uh, the other items, there's 15 boxes of items we've got to sort through and put in the archives. A lot of those are going to be photographed too and put up on the internet. Uh, brought tonight just a sample of some of the things that are here on the table. Um, so feel free to look at these. We think most of these items came from the WFLO studios when it was just right down the street here on 3rd Street. But I uh, have people from the station here tonight to help us, and uh, Henry's going to talk a little bit also. So I'm going to get started with PowerPoint. Um, let's see here what we got. Let me get this here going first. show tonight is like looking back at hometown radio, the early history of WFLO from 1946 to 1956. And that's basically from the time they uh, were planning and getting the station up and on the air to the time they moved out from downtown Farmville out to the Cumberland Road station. And we'll look at all of that here in just a minute. Um,
see there in the top left photograph, that's seven, eight of the boxes that are over Longwood right now. There are 15 total boxes, plus that little cart that was stuck. In that group of things was a WFLO scrapbook. Um, it's deteriorated right much, but they gave me the idea to make a digital scrapbook. So what I've done is made a digital scrapbook and uh, inserted many of the old photographs from the downtown station. But, um, before I get into the program, I'm going to show you a lot of the photographs, including some of these here on the table, had AG Studio on the back of it, so they were professional photographs. And I wanted to know, well, where was AG Studio? So I found out that it was upstairs right here in this building. Today, this is Terry Wilson, at Terry Atkins Wilson's law office. The AG Studio was upstairs. And before AG took it over, uh, it was Mr. Crowder's studio. Mr. Crowder was from Blackstone. He aged out and he turned it over to um, AG. Crowder turned it over to AG in 1949. So we know most of these photographs were not taken until the first two years of station that basically been on the air, a lot of them. So that's the history of the photographs. Um, you'll see also here on the table tonight, we've got four metal letters. And uh, right here, you can see them over on the table when we were unpacking them. Well, I looked at those letters and I said, you know, they look awful familiar. I believe these letters came from the State Theater, Marquee. Because I know in 1983, I was riding the projector at the State Theater, and we were opening, Walter McKay and I were opening the trading post, and I asked if I could have some of those letters down there to use to make our sign. They had a lot of extra letters, and they said, sure. So I picked out 19 letters and made an air sign. And what tells the tale is each one of these letters has got a groove cut in them right there. And that was so they would hang on that wire that ran and held up these um, letters up here. So I think that's where the letters came from. Do you know, did you ever see them on a building anywhere, Henry? No. Okay. So uh, we don't have, nobody really knows, as far as I know, where they were actually placed. But see they have uh, holes bored in them so somebody had them screwed up on something at some time. But moving on, there is the actual Devampolo scrapbook. Uh, not much left to it now, but that's where uh, we're going to pick up from that scrapbook and go on the digital scrapbook. And to start out the history, it actually dates back to 1883. When George W. Keyes was born, 1883, and he married a girl named Lena Sanders Keyes in 1901, but she only lived one year. So from 1902 on, Mr. Keyes was a bachelor again. So we move forward to 1921. He's been single for 19 years. And he meets Carla Burnham. Henry, do you know anything about her? How she met him or anything? I don't know how they met. I've got some information. Okay. Or later on, but not then. Okay. Um, we'll move on. So these two decided to get married. And uh, by that time, George Keyes was into the movie the movie theater business. Right. He, uh, he had a lot of business interests, but it looked like he was uh, really interested in theater. I think he had 11 theaters. Red Day. So during that 19 years he was single, he accumulated, I'd say, a lot of money, yeah. uh, very successful in all of his ventures that he was in. Uh, yeah, I know he had a college degree. 
He became a, an investor. He was a banker. Uh, he invested in real estate. Uh, he operated local theaters, one of them being the Majestic right here in downtown Johnson City. And he was also the city commissioner of Johnson City, Tennessee. Let's see. So these two, uh, George was 34 and Carla was 30 when they got married. Uh, they had no children that I know of. No. Okay. That will come into play here. So anyway, Carla and George go about making money, investing, and they're married for 15 years, which brings them up to 1936, when uh, George has a heart attack, they think, and he dies. So Carla's been married for 15 years. Uh, she receives an inheritance from her husband, uh, a large inheritance, but she has a problem. Problems arise for Carla. George leaves behind seven unhappy sisters. You ever hear about that, Edward? No. <laughs> so, the sisters decide that they should have gotten some or whatever part they thought they were entitled to. They take Carla to court in 1936 drags on in the court systems until March the 8th of 1939 when the courts upheld Carla's right to inherit the entire estate. Uh, she got an estate estimated at, at net worth of 180000 which in today's money that would be about three and a half million dollars. That multiplied greatly. Yes. <laughs> um, that was just from his estate, I would yeah. say. Um, so since George's death, he died in 36, she continued on running his business affair and just took right over. Uh, everything I've read about it says she had a good head for business. Um, she was very active in his civic groups and affairs around Johnson City. Um, so she's a rich widow. Estimated to have at least 300, 3.5 million from his estate. Uh, moving on, a year later, she's pictured in the newspaper dating William Harold Gray. That's Mr. Gray, and that's Carla with the big hat on. And they are attending a grand opening of WKPT in. Kingsport, Tennessee, I guess. Uh, yeah. Okay. And um, there they are, a big blown up picture of him. He's been in radio for 17 years and he works for WKPT Radio in Kingsport, Tennessee. Um, we know that they got married and um, they were dating in. July of 40, and they got married in October of 40. Uh, they went on a honeymoon, which we'll get to in the next slide. But shortly after they got back from their honeymoon, they were in an uh, accident with a truck. And I found this article in the newspaper where she asked for 25000 in damages for her and 500 for him quite a difference, but um, saying that uh, the newspaper never did say if they got what they asked for or not, but had she gotten the full amount, that would have been another half million in her pocket. Uh, here is a wedding announcement from the newspaper. I'm not sure, I think that was a Roanoke newspaper, but uh, they were married on October 11, 1940. It states that they plan to live in Rome, which I thought was unusual because he was basically from Greensboro, North Carolina, and she was from Illinois to start with. Indiana, excuse me, Indiana. Um, Carl is now 49 years old, and Harold is 42. So 
she married a young man about seven years. Um, Henry, is that the house? Did you ever go to her house? Yeah, I've been there. Is that it? I'm not sure. I don't remember exactly. It was a big house. Yeah. Um, story. The newspaper article that I found uh, when she died out in Tennessee says she died in this home right here. So I do know from the newspaper clippings that she evidently kept her house from her first marriage and she never changed her last name. She kept going by keys even though she married the second husband, um, which I thought was a little strange. Anyway, he um, he's called here in this article Pioneer in Radio, WKRP. They were uh, evidently remodeling or either just started that station and they built a new station. He seemed to be part of the building and getting it on the air. So that's about all I could figure on him. But um, in the final of Earl's, and I found a lot of Farmer Pearl stuff about him. Um, it says in 1947 newspaper article that he had been planning to build WFLO since 1941, but World War II interrupted their plans. So until after the war was over, late 45, early 46, they didn't get back to really working on establishing WFLO. Um, I did find that he, he, she and he hired a firm to figure out where would be a good market to place a radio station. And it came to be that they picked Farmville, Virginia. Because I had always wondered how in the world did they come to be here. I asked her one time, I said, why did you build uh, in Farmville and not in Keysville? <laughs> then she was Miss Keys. Yes. She said, we put a map up on the wall, and she said, I pointed to, I said, right here would be a good spot. That's the way they chose it, according to what she told me. Right. Well, I would guess that would be the truth. <laughs> so anyway, they ended up coming to Farmville. But the interesting thing was, once he started coming to Farmville, the newspaper is full of articles. Uh, they kept printing and printing and printing what he said. It was always what the husband had to say about it. She has never mentioned in any article leading right up to the year, the year of planning, putting it together, getting on the air. Her name is never mentioned. It's all about what he had to say. I mean, he was like, you could tell it looked like he was writing the newspaper articles. And I don't know how she felt about that, but we'll get to that in a minute. But uh, they'd been married six years by the time they got farmable, it seems. And he, he, by that time, had been in the radio business for 20 years. So by the time they got here and got the station open, she was 55 and he was around 48. So there it is. They, they've been married at this time. When it first started in 46, they've been married five years. And they look, look towards Farm for the next project. Um, here in the Farm with Girl in 1946 is one of the first articles which talks about he came to Farmville, met with the Farmville officials. And uh, he settled on Tom Bloomfield's building, which was under construction or just about complete at that time. And uh, it's 118 West 3rd Street. For any of y'all that don't know, that would be right here behind the bank that was Nation's Bank, Sovereign Bank, Virginia National Bank. It's right behind that bank. Or today it would be right across the street from Longwood visual arts. Um, so he met, uh, they decided to go into this building upstairs. He owned yeah, it. Pike's restaurant was at the bottom, I believe. Uh, at the time, the, the newspaper article says, to start with, 
uh, the Veterans Administration was on one side and the Unemployment Office was on the other side. And then right on here on this side was Bongo Cafe that Mike Pappas ran. And somebody was on this side, I've forgotten the name, but it was because Shorty Johnson later came in there and put the Red Front Grocery. He took over from a man that was leaving town. Um, so in 19, October 46, Harold Gray filed the application to the FCC to open the radio station. Um, Harold at the time uh, was planning, like I said, to go on Third Street, but he also had a plan to build in out by W, where WFLO is now. They had to build two buildings, one for the announcers downtown, then another building for the engineers to operate out of, and I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, he, he first published in the Bumble Hurl that the tower would be built just east of Bumble near the Bush River. So I ran down, I said, well, where in the heck was that? It turned out to be the property of Butch Gordon. So it was up on the hill about where you, if you left here and were going towards Rice, as, as you get on the bypass, it was up the hill on your right. It's a um, farm, uh, farm called Mount View Dairy Farm. Don't know what happened, but that plan fell apart and a few weeks later they changed it in the newspaper to say it would be on Route 45 in Barbara. Um, Francis, do you want to tell us why they had to have two, a separate place, two separate places? Yeah, well, um, back then you had to have an engineer on duty at all times. So the engineer had to, he controlled everything up there. He took the readings and uh, you know they would do the shows live over here, but he he was kind of like a producer. So he had to be out there the whole time. That was the FCC road, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the station naturally had to be on one of the highest points around to keep from having to build a tower that's so tall. Yeah. In the meantime, 1947, on January the 31st, 1947, it came out in the Farmville Hurl that Dr. Sidna right here, who was a dentist, Barry Wall and Mr. Willis Jr. announced or were announcing that they planned to put a w WSVS station here in Farmville also. So there were two stations, both trying to get on the air in 1947. Most people don't realize that WSVS had one of their original broadcast stations here in Farmville. Yeah. Um, and I'll show you a better picture later, but WFLO started out here, and WSVS started out in the upstairs of WF, um, the Farmville Rural Building. So these two articles go ahead uh, and talk about both stations, uh, what they're doing to get on the air, and uh, it also mentions that the engineers building out by Route 45 North would be built by a tail manufacturing company and be 25 by 40 feet in size. There's a, a picture of the first building to be built out on Cumberland Road. And uh, probably doesn't look familiar to you in this picture, but there is the original tower, and that was the original building that the engineers would work out of. And um, basically just saying what I just said, the new building there with the tower. Uh, so here's Route 45, here's the whole station now, we we'll just built this end down here to start with, and they put the tower back here in the back. Um, so in case that doesn't look familiar to you, here's how it looks today. Well, there it is right there in this drawing. But 
the deed as a built this building in 1947, and, that, and it remained just that building. And in 1956, Ms. Keyes decided to add this addition. So that's why it looks like this today, but it only started out to look like that. Um, Ms. Keyes, when she built this, built an apartment upstairs, and she would stay up there when she came to, to um, oversee the operations, I guess. Yeah. Uh, well, she would come a couple times a year. Yes. Uh, a unique thing about upstairs, uh, all the flooring is put in. There are no nails. It was put together with mahogany pegs. <laughs> you still like that, you know. Yeah. Looks brand new, the floor. And, uh, and one of the newspaper articles, it said that the Home Demonstration Club and different people met, did they actually broadcast? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Five days a week, different months. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. She put a door knocker, which we had with her name on it, on the door going upstairs. Yeah. And now that's stored over at Longwood with the other items. <clears throat> Um, so there's a building that WFLO took a hole upstairs. Um, there's a door you went up. And then, like I said, there were two government buildings downstairs. I figured Mr. Bloomfield put the building up to house. In other words, he had good leases on these two down here. And then when WFLO came along, he was able to re or arrange the walls and they built office space to suit WFLO's needs. That's the way the newspaper reads. It wasn't complete upstairs, so the station was laid out on Mr. Crow according to the paper. Um, it was called the Radio Center. Um, they got the um, 870 was given to them as a number. Thousand watt daytime station. It was AM only up until 1960, 61. 61. Uh -huh. um, and uh, let's see what I've got here. The, the Veterans Administration and Unemployment Administration were on the downstairs, and WF Beloved had to hold upstairs for the radio center. Uh, the call letters they were assigned were. FL for Farmwell and O was to stand for own. And I've never understood that. Do you ever hear any explanation of that? No. no. Uh, any, any station, correct me if I'm wrong, any station on the east side of Mississippi started with a W. Mm -hmm. The stations out west all started with K. That way they could FCC would know which side of Mississippi. So that's how we came to have WFLO. Um, so the next part I'm going to show you, I'm getting real far, we're going to let Henry talk a little bit. But uh, so Mr. Bloomfield built this building, it's two stories, flat roof, and they occupied the entire second floor. I went down there and I looked at the building. It had windows all, all four sides. Uh, this side right here originally had a, a restaurant built up against it. And on the other side, there's still a building. Uh, I took a picture of these steps because I know in 1953, Al Smith came to work. And I was amazed that Al Smith climbed those steps on crutches every day. That was a, a quite a feat, wasn't it? Yes, it was. He was super strong in his arm strength. So, of course, without the lower extremities, you know, yeah, it didn't weigh as much as it appeared to. Yes. So, I remember his line was, this is Al Smith reminding you that a winner never quits and a quitter never, never wins. wins. Yeah, that's right. I remember that. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, when I was doing all this research, putting this show together, I kept wondering what it, what does it look like upstairs. I, I'd been up there a couple times uh, to see
see Don blessing and different things. So, but it, I didn't remember what it looked like up there. So I went down there one day to look in the windows, and it was a uh, this thing right here, and it had a phone number on it, floor plan of what they planned on making it look like. So I called that number, and I said to myself, you know, this lady's gonna probably hang up on me. I told her, I said, I don't want to buy anything and I don't want to rent anything, but I would like to ask you a few questions what it looks like upstairs. She said, would you like to see the upstairs? I told her what I was doing. She said, I'll come up tomorrow to Farmville and I will let you in and you can take all the pictures and do all the looking you want to do. So next morning I met her and we went upstairs and uh, I'll show you some pictures I took up there. Uh, it looks like at one time somebody had gone in there and remodeled the whole place, but uh, this company she represents, her daddy owns it, and they had come in there now and kind of gutted all that stuff out of there that covered up the station, and you can, uh, now you can see the how it was with the station again. So uh, she told me that uh, at this time, you know, the parrots had gone out and parrots was changing over. She said the man that was downstairs at the tattoo parlor had bought parrots. And they bought this building from the tattoo man so he could buy parrots. So that's how all that came about. So these are the people that redid the Doyne building. She took me away and took me on a tour of that building too. But now this building, they're trying to lease it out. They may have somebody for the downstairs, but the upstairs they don't really have anything going on with that yet. But um, let me get out of this and I'm going to show you the pictures that I took when I went down there. It's a four minute movie of the inside of that building. I wanted to figure out where the um, current and all went into the building so I could try to put the floor plan together. That's Miss Keys. And I figured from the 15 or so big photographs I had, I could figure out where what was what. That, I believe, was the big room where they had the piano and groups would come in and sing. Yeah. There's a picture of it. And you can see the curtains and one of those two windows in the background. That floor, I believe, is still on the floor. That next room over is where I think the small studio was, where the guy sat behind the desk. And back to the big room there, and that, that shows those two big windows. Yeah. That's the one I used to watch the yeah. musicians. There, there it is again. That's John Wilson on the left, and John Calvin, we think, on the right. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's one, and there are the curtains and the big windows in the background yeah. again. That insulation, uh, sound insulation, is still, still up around the edges of the walls. The, do the doors are number two, one through, one, two, three, four, and the numbers are still on the door. You can see that in the background of this picture, you can see those windows to the left, you can see there are more windows down to the left there. There is the little, the lady told me that desk or console area there was still there when they took over the building. And there's a good view of what it looks like today. Those two windows you probably look through, can you? Yeah. And I think the other little studio was at the end. Um, that he is sitting at the same consoles, the other fellow. There, and there's, on the left there where that broomstick is, that's a, a window between the two little rooms that they can 
could see each other. That's the small room had a window in it too. Now that's in the small studio looking back over into what I call the piano room. That's the room across the hall there where all that insulation is piled up. And I think that's where they had the little Yanana press machine, the record storage and so on. Notice they're all 78 records. Yeah. Uh, there's this room on the left here is where the men at the desk sat. There's a picture of that little fence that went right there in the middle of the room. On the right side there are the men that worked at the desk and they would have been right there where that chair is. That would be the fence went right there in the middle of that room there. That's again where the desk would have sat. That's the biggest part of the whole thing. Another picture of them behind that little fence. There's a hallway that goes right down the middle of the room with the studio on the right, the desk area on the right, the studio is on the left there. The two rooms way down the far end were where the manager's office was, I believe. There's the one that window behind him with there it is the big manager's office, and that would look right down on Third Street. And that's all of that. Yeah, right, right here. Uh huh. Yeah. Beside the people that work there. Right. Yeah. So I, I'm pretty 
shot the old furniture company. It was over top of Farmville Girl and Farmville, and uh, the paper just said they were in downtown crew. I don't know where. But, uh, so two weeks later, it comes out in the Farmville Girl that W.F. Lowe expects to open soon goes over the same basic story, tells Mr. Bloomfield Owens building what's downstairs, all of that. Um, and like we just talked about, the men downtown would speak into the microphone that would leave this building and go over to Cumberland, and then from there go out over the airwaves on the tower. And we actually had Three engineers were mentioned early on. That was Charlie Christman, yeah. O.C. Covington. That's a young picture of O.C. Yeah. And um, yeah, the third man was Fred Reed. Uh, did you ever know him? I didn't know him. Because uh, I worked with the other two. But. Yeah. Uh, all I could get on Fred Reed was that he was from Hampton, Sydney area. Um, he was mentioned the first year or so, so, but, it, you know, um, he's in one of the pictures, I'll, I'll show him. He's in two of the pictures. Um, that's Charlie, that's O.C. in later years, and that's the only picture of one of the two pictures of Fred. Um, August 17, 1947 was the formal opening of Below. The newspaper article actually says they started eight the day before on Sunday afternoon. No, I guess it was Saturday afternoon, August 16th, at the formal opening on the 17th. And there's a list of all the advertisers. I know it's too little to read, but um, it is interesting to look back at all the names of all the stores that were that are gone now. Um, here's a, a big close-up of the office area where the guys sat at the desk behind that little fence. And that would have been the manager's office up there on the front. Um, and we have an actual clipping of that, and it tells who the people were and so on. Um, very first week or so was a guy named Lewis Hubbard, Chuck Mallet, 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 Fred Reed, who was the engineer, Miss Dixie Roundy, also known as Flo, Wayne Van, who I didn't pick his name up anywhere else, Tommy Lane, who a lot of people know Tommy Lane, and Buddy Whitaker, and Sylvia Flippin. Tommy Lane and Buddy Whitaker live next door to each other on High Street. Uh, Tommy, uh, both of their houses backed up to the Palmer Earl building. Uh, the Lane house got torn down, but the Whitaker house is still on the corner there beside the Hotel Wine Oak. And there's Miss Keys. Uh, that was a picture that appeared in 1947 of her and Palmer Earl. Here's an early picture. This, like I said, couldn't have been taken until probably 49, but that is Fred Reed right there. Yeah. Um, Charlie Chris, Chrisman, Chuck Mellett, Ray Ryan, Danny Shaver, and John Wilson with a goatee. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't recognize John, but, um, Original staff was W. Harold Gray. This is how they printed it in the paper. Manager and co-owner. He would soon be replaced. Yeah. <laughs> Carla Key's wife, co-owner, soon to be the sole owner. Tommy Lane, commercial manager. Buddy Whitaker was an office manager. It should be Lewis. No. Lewis of it. Lewis Hubbard, director, program director of music, engineers, Charlie Chrisman, and O.C. Covington.
coming in and Fred Reed. And the next year or so coming along, I picked up the name Dixie Roundy, who was the first woman announcer, according to the paper. Um, she was copywriter, announcer. Uh, H. Harold Gray's early secretary was Miss Anna Meek. Now that was Lane's secretary, Linda P. Smith, Charlie Mallet, announcer. And soon Jim Wilson would arrive as manager. Well, I thought they had that wrong. I thought it should have been John, but it was actually a Jim Wilson. And he came here. Um, what happened was Miss Gray, I mean Miss Keys and Harold Gray. Uh, came to an agreement that they were going to disagree, and she got rid of him right away. Yeah. Uh, we don't know the exact date, but he didn't last long after the grand opening of the station. I think she felt like he was spending her money in. Lots of it. <laughs> On foolish things. Okay. So um, he, he disappeared, and she hired Jim Wilson, who's had a, he and his dad evidently had a radio station in Bristol, Virginia, or Tennessee. And he left and came here and he worked for one year, and then he went back and joined his daddy again at the station they supposedly owned. And by 1949, we had Wayne Vane, <coughs> Ray Ryan had come on, Joe Roberts, Danny Shaver, and soon. And I have a name Carl Back, and it's also written as Carl Beck in some places. Do you know the correct? I don't either know. So we'll call him Carl Beck. That's probably more realistic, but yeah. I don't know. And Eddie Perry would, from WSBS would join the staff. John D. Wilson arrived in 1949 as an announcer and as a copywriter. He was not hired as a manager. Right. I think he became manager in 53. Correct. That's right. Uh, early on, it seems that the people would come, stay a year or so, and then they would move on to what they felt was bigger and better jobs. So it was quite a bit of rotation <coughs> early on with the hill. I think John found a wife. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, let's see, moving on. Uh, just show you some of the early pictures from AG's photography. Uh, this is probably, and some of these right on the table if you want to look at them afterwards. But uh, that's Miss Keys, and I know that was taken in 1952, and that one's on the table. You can get a better look at it uh, because it's written right on the bottom of the picture, fifth anniversary, 1952. Danny Shaver. Chuck Mallet. Mallet. Yep, keep wanting to call him Mallet. Mallet. Um, Ray Ryan. I'm not real sure who that is. I can't. I can't, I can't tell that. I don't know. I don't think we brought that picture over tonight, but um, um, I think that's Ray Ryan in the room with the records were stored. This looks like it's probably, uh, it seems to be an electrical box. Somewhere in the newspaper articles it said they had 28 phone lines coming into the building. And the article went on to say they had seven clocks, one in every room, so that led me to believe it was seven rooms. Ray Ryan, Chuck, Carl, Eddie. Danny didn't arrive until 13 months after the station got going. Um, there's a good look at the console. What would you call it? The console? Console, yeah. yeah. And uh, this piece of equipment here matches a lot of pictures that were taken right on up until Al Smith is seen in front of that. So I would assume if Al was in front of that, it was taken at the old station. Uh, what's the story on that microphone? I'm not sure. It's an RCA microphone. 
we had two or three of them like that. Right. That one, that one still, uh, did y'all keep that for a long, long time? I have no. Okay. So that's one of the original or early microphones, okay? Um, in 1954, there's John Wilson. By this time, he's working there and had become the manager. And that's Miss Keys with him. As you can see, when she came and had these parties, she always had a um, bunch of these signs printed up and all ran in the background of the pictures. So I could take the pictures by the year on that. Uh, this is Lewis Hubbard right here. I don't know anything about him. And that's the only picture I have of him. So he must not have uh, been there too long. Uh, Carl. All back. He's there, and you can see to his left, he, you can see over into the next studio. Yeah. I like what they got there. You can see that's the thing that looks like came off of a desk. Held there by two books with the <laughs> clipboard. <laughs> but I picked that up looking at it. Where's the commercial? Yeah. Um, here, here is. Um, room where they would have people come in and perform. Uh, and I was interested to note that uh, these, Danny looked like he played an instrument, and Chuck Mallet also looked like he played the piano. Then on, on a lot of the pictures they were written on the back who they were. And that's Chuck, and that's Ray Ryan. There's Mary Reed. Mary Reed there in the middle. I was wondering if she was kin to the engineer, Mr. Reed there. I don't there. think so. Okay. Bill was her husband. Okay. And they lived in the station. <laughs> Down there? Uh, on 3rd oh, Street. I mean on 45. Okay. Mm. I talked to her recently. <coughs> okay. She's still living. Well, let her know we still have her picture. <laughs> She'll be on YouTube before she knows it. Uh, and I thought this was her too, but on the back of it, I guess somewhere it says Dixie Cheetah. Yeah. What, what was her? Did she work there? Yeah, she was a bookkeeper type or copywriter or something. Okay. Uh, he looks like he's interested in it. <laughs> Ray Ryan. It's quite a story about him. He died of a broken neck. Yes. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and those are some of the uh, Al Lancaster. They had a little local country band. And I thought Lan Lancaster was his name too, but I also found it spelled Lanchester. And I, I knew him, but I've never heard it called anything but Lanchester. Lancaster. Chester. Lanchester, okay. Well, that's how they have it spelled. Did anybody know who that is? We just call him unknown. Unknown. And there's Chuck there. And as you can see, that uh, one of the two windows is there in the background. And uh, Carl, Danny, and I'm assuming this might be Danny. Does anybody know for sure? No, that's not me. It's not, it's not, it's not, oh, my God, Danny. Is that Bobby Fulton? Uh, it's too early for Bobby, I think. Uh, I true. had Bobby coming to work there at another date. But this, I mean, this yeah, looks like. The one right is Danny. Uh, I don't know who that is. <laughs> well, we will uh, change that to unknown. <laughs> the picture uh, looks different than all the others, too. Yeah. So it could be a later picture. Yeah, but it's not Danny Shaver. Okay. I know that. Okay, we'll get that corrected. Um, just some more pictures of Danny. Yeah. And Carl. At this time, um, Chuck was the manager in this photograph. And, um, we know this is the fifth anniversary. There's Miss Keys welcoming Dixie Roundy. Is that how you say it? Yeah. Okay, and she is listed in the paper as the first female announcer. Um, and there's, there's a 
big picture and they have Sunshine Sioux. Were they connected somehow? They, they were from the old Dominion Barn Dance in Richmond. Uh, they broadcast over WRVA and they did guest uh, appearance. Okay. And then they have, of course, <coughs> the three there and it looks like two of them playing on the instrument. And um, it appears here that these John and uh, the right. John Calhoun. Cal kind of right there, right? Yeah. Okay, that's what we thought. And uh, John Wilson, Ray Ryan, John Wilson there, shoved the same group over again. Um, it appears they're inside that big room and uh, going through the mail or something, possibly. Yeah. But uh, here's where Jim Wilson, who had been there a year, decided to go back and join his father in Bristol, in Bristol, Virginia. First anniversary was August 12th, and like I say, Harold Gray is gone. Jim Wilson is the station manager. Uh, just that's a good picture of Miss Keys. I blew that up. Um, more of the same pictures. Um, I Owen and Virginia Partners, and I noticed in this picture, there's Chuck. Chuck. And I think he's just posing, no. Oh, well, then. No, he didn't actually play the fiddle. No, and, and that is. Dan and Dan. Davey. You think they're just both posed? Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is uh, the Bailey Brothers, three Bailey Brothers from right. Charlotte County in the band. Yes. Out of Owen's band. Uh, I do know that their names are written on the back of the uh, picture, and I have it somewhere. I don't know if I have it in the program here. Lewis, Cephas, and I can't make the third one right off. Yeah, and it's written on the back. Yeah. Um, I also put it here that in March of 49, the uh, 45 RPM records came out. So I guess before they left downtown, they'd gone and used the 45s also. Also, yeah. Okay. Um, in 1971, Paul died. And uh, I noticed in her obituary, she mentions her first husband who left her the money, but she makes no mention of Carl Gray. No. See. Gone. Yeah. And um, it appears from what I can find out in the newspaper that Harold returned to Hagerstown, Maryland, where he worked for WJEJ, and he uh, reported to sell ads in a news commentator. And he lived 10 more years after she basically dismissed him. And he died in 1958 at the age of 60. And he was buried in Roanoke, Virginia. So that's the last mention we have of Mr. Gray. Um, it just goes on to say that um, the people basically, um, after she left her second husband, she kept on living up in um, Johnson City, Tennessee tending to the uh, business that her husband's had left her and she just continued right on with civic activities and came to Paul from time to time to check things out. Yeah. Uh, the early station managers were Harold Gray to start with, but he didn't last long. Right. Then James Wilson came in for a year, then Chuck right. Mailett. From 48 to 53, and then in 53, John Wilson took over. And um, Joe Roberts came, and he lasted 18 months, and he died while working at the station at the age of 60. And the thing of interest is that um, 
he had a program called Taylor's Trading Post. And it's it that uh, Robert Taylor, Taylor Manufacturing, right. sponsored it Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. And the way it worked was you didn't call in and talk about your item. You had to mail in a postcard with the information. And Joe would read it. And uh, I guess they would, he, they would you know, meet. They would leave a phone number or an address. And he would read it and they could write it down. And so it was a little different than how it was in later years, but yeah. that was probably the, something the idea he had probably seen before and put it on the air, and that eventually, I assume, turned into Trade Post Hotline or right. whatever. Correct. I always think of Tommy Jenkins when I think of that <laughs> <Yeah>. show. <laughs> uh, there's Joe. He was evidently very popular the way that all the articles read about. But uh, I think it said he died of a heart attack also. Uh, John started the station in 49 and became the manager in 1953, like he said, Henry. Uh, here is a picture of Fred Reed, the uh, engineer. And the reason I included this was in the early days, if they went out to do a live broadcast, basically they tape record on a recorder. Yeah. And here's an article about this building right here, which is right there, right across the street. That was a Greyhound bus station. And there's Fred Reed recording it on a tape recorder. Then they would take it back to the station and play it. Same way with the uh, tobacco market sales. Yes, a lot of different things. They would um, they would go ahead and record it and then play it back until they finally got the capability yeah. to go on. Do you know what year they bought that Corvette van? Uh, it was before we were married in '61 because it was in the late '50s. Yeah, okay, so it was early on. Yeah, early. On. They made them from 61 to 65, so it must have been like 61. It must have been early 61 because before we got married, I remember I was using it on some uh, different things. Yeah, different works. Right. Yeah. It could have, uh, if it was a 61 model, it was probably produced in September of 60. Yeah. So, do you know where you bought it? Uh, no, I really don't. I know we bought one from uh, Jimmy Forbes, but I don't know where that particular model came from. Do you know where the uh, Corvette van went in? The end? To the junkyard, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ward Act. Yeah. Uh, just some pictures of Danny. He came in February 51. No, in 51, he was Danny Shaver. is leaving WFLO for a job in WSSB in Petersburg. Danny had been with WFLO for three years. So that appeared in the paper. In 52, Jody Rainwater or yep. Charles Edward Johnson started at WSBS and Crew. Yeah. And I'm assuming he was a good friend of yours. Yeah, yes, absolutely. And you started shortly after he did. Yeah. So when I got his uh, autograph and everything, I mean, it was on the back. I guess it was on that picture. Well, there. actually, he started, uh, well, what, in 52, I started in 56. Okay. So four years. Okay. Uh, there is a WSBS station. That, that is still in operation today. Yeah. Okay. Um, here's a name that popped up. In 1953, Burton Maskin arrived and he worked at WFLO. Did you ever heard of him? No, I haven't. 
Nobody I talked to knows anything about him, but there it is in front of the world. It must have been short and sweet to him. <laughs> Mrs. Keys may have sent him to see he worked in Johnson City. Yeah. So, so she, it's probably somebody she knew got to come in there for a while. Yeah. No, we don't have a picture of him that I know of. I did find this too interesting. In the, in the early years, W. Hello in the newspaper, I guess each week, put a listing of the shows and the time they would be on in the newspaper. Support for Mr. Wall. <laughs> but, um, just some more pictures. Uh, Chuck Mallet returned here in this building, I think it was. Was it 2010? No, uh, 2005, was it? You had an event here? It was our 60th. What year? 60th anniversary. Yeah, okay, 60th anniversary. Well, there he is. Um, there he is there, Miss Keys. There he is there. And he came back. He stayed in touch with the people in Farmville. And uh, I figured out why he, uh, well, his wife was from Prospect. Yes, he, um, I guess I can see it. Chuck Mallet, 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 was in the military during World War II. He was stationed in Blackstone at Camp Pickett. There he met and married his wife, Bernice LaForce, a prospect. She was in the nurse corps. Chuck became the station manager in 1948 when Jim Wilson resigned at WFLO. Chuck was a manager for five years. What drew my attention to the article is Chuck's father-in-law was a test pilot in the Air Force, and he, uh, his family lived in Prospect, and they were having a Fourth of July picnic, and he flew from Ohio to be with him, and he was going to land in Lynchburg. And as the story goes in the newspaper, he flew over the house and crashed right up in Prospect, not far from that house. They saw the plane. Prison time field. Prison time field, and he died. Mm -hmm. So Chuck was his son-in-law. And uh, when I went up Prospect to an event three, four, five years ago, they were talking about it when we were walking on High Bridge Trail, one of the Campbell girls mentioned it. And I had never heard of that, but that was, um, there's an article about it, and I do have the whole article if somebody wants a copy of it. But um, the other thing I thought was interesting was Chuck's mother-in-law had a sister, and she was Miss C.J. Cox. And Miss C.J. Cox and her husband, as I recall, owned Wombo Motor Company. Correct. Where the mini mall and things were on Main Street. They had the Chrysler dealership. Right. So Chuck had family here, and uh, he would come back and forth and visit from time to time and came here to one of y'all's 60th anniversary parties. So that is another reason he kept in touch. He went on to uh, buy a radio station yeah. and operated it up near with Portsmouth, Ohio, which was near St. Louis. Well, that was an interesting story. Uh, there's a story about him. There he is, right there. Returned after all those years. Uh, he, uh, John, when he left, John Wilson took his place. Uh, another interesting story I ran across was two WFLO employees at met at work and married in September of 1953. And that would have been John Calhoun. He married Doris Hamlet of yeah. Judasville. I think last I heard she's still living. I, I don't I'm know. By John. Um, I knew both of them because they had a daughter named Melissa. Yeah. And uh, my 
mother had just started running her nursery school and my mother kept the child and one or the other of them would come to our house and pick the child up and uh, you know, he would talk about the radio station. Yeah. And uh, we knew Miss Hamlet's mother, she lived somewhere down off 307, then was yeah. Rose going to Jesusville. And I would see him from time to time. But uh, there, there's Brad's picture and John, uh, there he is, and there he is. Um, so he stuck around for a good number of years. He left in 57. Yeah. I don't know where he went. Fredericksburg, I believe. In fact, he hired Gene Ike to that station up there and recommended him come in here. Hmm. That's interesting. I never had heard that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so here's where it talks about another article I found where John Wilson to succeed mail it as manager. And here's some early pictures and so on of John Wilson. Do, do you know, when did Gene and John get Wilson get married? He's, he's a married. They when did Gene and John oh. Wilson get married? I'm not sure. I, when I first met them, they were already married, but I, I don't know when they got married. Um, they must have been together early on because we have a record where Gene sang and cut a record I believe it's the date in 1946. And we, we have it over long. Oh. I never knew she was a singer. I didn't either, no. So I don't know. We never played the record, but right. we have it over there. But moving along here, um, there's Al Smith. He arrived in 1953. And uh, John had just come to work as a manager. I mean, he had just started as a manager, so they worked together for 28 years. And that, you can see that console right there matches with one and the other picture. So I assume that's uh, taken at the old station downtown. And uh, in this picture right here, it seems to be the same control panel again. I noticed this little okay. WF little banner hanging up, so I'm thinking this banner is probably from the downtown. That's the same one. It doesn't yeah. look like the one on yes, it does. the side. Yes, it, it looks the same, so I'm assuming yes, it yeah. probably came from downtown. When we brought these items over, we tried tonight to only bring down the things from the early station. Yeah, right. Uh, so Al came here, and there are some various different pictures of Al over the years. And uh, in 57, he was appointed the uh, program director. And even though this is beyond 56, yeah. uh, a lot of people have asked me about his automobile accident. Um, I remember when he wrecked, it was on a Sunday night, he ran into a pole or tree up here on High Street. Tree, yeah. Right as you start up High Street from the intersection where Appomattox, Griffin, all that comes to that stuff. When he went up through there, and I don't know, was he driving? He was driving, yeah. He was driving his yeah. car, and it was probably convertible. It was. And, uh, and everybody has always asked, who was he with? Well, it was Lacey Cumby. Yeah. I'd always thought it was someone else, but it was Lacey Cumbie, according to the paper. Better known as Butch. Butch Cumbie, yeah. the younger one. Yeah. And um, they put Al in the hospital for a good number of days, months maybe. And uh, the newspaper article goes on to say that he received over 2,000 cards while he was laid up. But he lost his legs in earlier years ago. Yes. Um, when he came to Marble, he had lost his legs. A uh, truck had caught him between a load dock and yeah. a truck. Truck that he worked for. And he was in the military. And he came back and went out to 
and visit. And that's when his legs, it's quite a story about that. Uh, he collected $3 million after 25 years lawsuit, but he never got it because he had a police buddy in New York, a little dwarf, who used to come to see him. And he let him he keep the money hidden up there in the camp, and Al never got it. Mm. And uh, he died. Yeah, and he died. Hello. Mm. Uh, it was quite a story. Yes. Let me get on here. We're, I'm going to turn it over to you, Henry, in just a second. Uh, that's Al, when he was here, he, uh, he wrote a book. Had a big article about an ex Yankee wrote a story about the Confederacy, I believe it was. Uh, he was he was into um, helping uh, the youth of Farmville, the scouts, uh, church groups, all kinds of sporting things. He was into that. Uh, he did, he went to the sock hops and set up and played records yeah. and so on. He did that. Uh, very popular doing that. Uh, there's Bobby Showalter uh, talking to Al at the station about some Pixie Youth business, and there's Al on the air. Uh, Al died on March 30th, 1982. He was 59 years old. And uh, he died in March, in December, Prince Academy at the time dedicated a portrait to Al. So I read the article about it and I said, well, I wonder where that picture is now. We don't have it over long, but so I called up the school and they said, come on up here, we got it. So I went up there and it's hanging in the gymnasium right where they put it years ago and it's never been moved. So uh, there's a picture of it being dedicated. That's Gene Ike right there. Uh, of course, Jim McGall wasn't with the radio station, but there he is. John Wilson, Larry Lasua, Ann McGay, and T.J. Fulcher were there for the dedication. And I'm assuming the other ladies and kids were with the Prince Edward Academy. But um, there's a picture. I went up there and took a picture of the portrait. And while I was there, I went over here to the ballpark which was right across from the school. And in 1976, they officially dedicated that ball field as the Al Smith Field. And the sign is still in the building and there's a fact telling uh, about the dedication and so on. That's still hanging up there too. Uh, just uh, his obituary there it says he came down here from here, Long Island, New York. And uh, just goes on to tell a little bit of his history. We won't go in that tonight. But, um, and like Henry said about this Ray Ryan, right here in the middle of this picture here, there he is. He left WIPLO in 1953, according to the article moved out to a town called Mexico. Um, Mexico, Missouri, which is near St. Louis, and he was going to be a manager of the country club out there. And he went on a vacation, I assume, or a trip back to Elizabeth City, North Carolina, doing some diving and swimming and in the water, probably too shallow. He broke his neck, and he died there.
completed in that time the, the uh, studios in what the announcers were over here, this became the secretary's office. And then Miss Keys had a living space up here and they did some broadcasting up there. They had a big open house. She was T.J. Uh, Kenbo. Okay. Uh, Irma Clements at the time. Here she yeah. is. She's That's here it. with us tonight. It's the only job I ever had, except uh, in high school when I worked some. Um, with that, that's all the slides I have. I'm going to let Henry tell us some memories of Miss Keys and other memories he has at the station there. Then we'll wrap it up. Thank you. Uh, by the way, Ray Myers played music there. He was the world's only harmless musician. <clears throat> I have a book on him, and I knew him, and I saw a lot of his shows. He could take his right foot and reach in his pants pocket and count change out. Well, I've got pictures of him drinking coffee in a restaurant under the station out there on 3rd Street. And, you know, he'd pick it up with his toe and drink his coffee. He'd comb his hair, you know, like that. And I saw him swim, drive a car, and uh, in a little car base with Ray Ryan. <coughs> but uh, there's several things about Ms. Keys that I was in the right time, the right place. Uh, one time she was up to visit, and she asked me if I would take her to Sam Lochner's out in Cumberland. Now, Sam was a, uh, he was a, 
was not what you'd call the upper crust. And but she had known him back in Tennessee when that TVA took the uh, built the big dam down there, and a lot of folks moved to Virginia from there. And uh, Sam lived alone. He wasn't the greatest housekeeper, maybe, but I took her down to his house, and it blessed me to sit this lady who had been around Kings, and she and Sam laughed and talked, and I thought, how wonderful that someone who could have been up across was just so comfortable talking and, you know, fellowshipping with him. And I thought I'd mention that. She invited Joyce and I to come and spend a week with her in Johnson City to tell you what kind of lady she was. We stopped at Marion to get some supper. She had a lady driving us, was four of us. We went in and sat down, had our food, and the waitress brought the check. And I was the only guy, so and she gave it to me. Ms. Keys had class. Somehow or another, she I had a $50 bill in her hand under the table, and she rolled it up and handed it under there to me, and nobody saw her do it. And so I got up and, and paid the check. But I mean, you know, that, that speaks loudly to me. Uh, we, while we were there, there was a, a gas company that was going to build a block square, in fact, they already built it, a building next door to her and would be open 24 hours a day. Her older sister was an invalid and lived with her. And she apparently had called that gas company, had been in touch with them. And while I was in the room, she called. Uh, they got calls. Uh, they called her. And she talked to this man from the gas uh, service uh, company. And uh, Ms. Keyes told him, said, I have, I'll give you three options. I'll buy this property next door, which is almost a block square. She said, I'll buy it at a fair price. Or if you don't sell it and you build a and start to open the gas station 24 hours a day. She said, my sister will never be able to sleep. And if you do that, I'll have the city council uh, condemn it. And I'll never forget these words. And she said, if you don't do that, and you'll pardon the expression, she says, I'll buy the damn oil company. <laughs> They sold it to her. And you know, the old black gentleman who was her gardener, he said, she made 24 apartments out of that big building and took some folks that she had known years ago who had hard times and she let them live in those 24 apartments. And the old gentleman said, every Friday, I take the truck and I go to the grocery store and I buy all our groceries and I deliver them to each apartment and she takes care of it all. Mm -hmm. What a lady. And he also said uh, she took 75 members of the Garden Club of Johnson City to Yugoslavia for six weeks and they stayed with uh, the uh, in the palace of, uh, let's see now, I made a note here. <laughs> Marshal Tito. Mm. See, the 75 and stayed in his palace. And uh, one of the most outstanding things, I think, is that when she died, she left not only things to us and a lot of other people. She left $75 million to Milligan College in East Tennessee. She was a very unique lady.
Yeah, very acidic mine, isn't it? How often did she come to farm? About twice a year. <clears throat> About twice a year. And she usually would bring, someone would bring her, uh, usually the piano player. Uh, we have an organ upstairs, and like at Christmas, we'd sing, and the lady would play, and this lady was like a semi-professional. She would do concerts out in public, and uh, she was also a driver. She said that police stopped them somewhere down in southwest Virginia, and uh, in a way, they wanted a, a I don't know what was uh, uh, permit back to car or something. So Miss Keys opened up. She said, "I got in here somewhere." And the first thing she pulled up was a gun, it was a pistol, laid in the seat, and then she began to pour money, just thousands of dollars out of there. And the officer said, "Lady, never mind." <laughs> You just uh, pack that stuff up and get on up the road. <laughs> Character. Yes, she was. She was very prim, though. Very prim and proper. She really was. She didn't like ladies wearing slacks. You know, I mean, she was kind of old-fashioned. But she was a new, uh, very unique lady. Uh, Charlie Crispin was quite a character. He would come in when you were on the air, and most of our stuff was done live. And you'd be talking to him at commercial, and he'd come in now and over your shoulder and start saying stuff that you. You had to cut off. You couldn't. You couldn't let that go on the air. He would do that and laugh, you know. At one time, she had come in and was, uh, was upstairs. And uh, he convinced me, she had a little dog named Peggy. He convinced me to put the dog harness on my heel and get it on my hands and knees and crawl into the studio where uh, John Calhoun was doing live stuff. And she figured, he figured that would really shake him up. So we were crawling in there and I look and I see four feet and uh, two of the feet from Miss Keys. <laughs> and so all I did, I just turned around and paddled on back out <laughs> and hoped she didn't see who it was. <laughs> that is some uh, stories we would have never known if we hadn't gotten together tonight. Right. Yeah, I'm glad to hear, you know. Yeah. She took us out on the yacht. She had a yacht that was double hull. And uh, her, there was a military, Bob. I don't even remember what Bob's last name was. He ran the boat for her. Oh, he did? Yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she had this yacht. And she took us out on her. She had just had, who was it? Uh, Secretary of Defense John, no, what was his name? Was it Warner? Warner? John Warner? Warner? No. No, it was prior to John Warner. It was, he was the Secretary of Defense. And he uh, had been there on two or three days on the boat. And she gave the yacht to the captain. She left that to him. And let's see, she left in, in 11 states, I think she owned theaters. And uh, she left those to everybody. She gave them away. She had the government with her. Yeah. So we on Saturday, uh, she took us downtown to meet some of her managers. And there was like four blocks on each side. She owned everything. Jewelry store, paint stores, theater. The Paramount, I believe it was, there. And the parking spaces, the empty parking lots. She owned it all. 
and we got her to cross the street, she'd just do like that, and traffic both ways would immediately stop. <laughs> and we, she took us into the back. They were having a board meeting, and of course, when she pecked on that door, they broke the meeting up and came out and made it over her. And she took us into the vault and showed us some money and all of that. Pretty good. Yeah, but she was a nice, really nice lady. She must have had a good job. Manager. Yes. Thank you. Anything else you want to say? Well, there's a lot of things I could say, but thank you for allowing me to come down. And the rest of the staff here. Yeah. But I happen to be the oldest one left, so maybe I remember back further. In fact, I remember the Dead Sea before it got ill. <laughs> and I remember Eve when she was just a rib. <laughs> what was the most unusual thing that happened to you at, while you were in radio? Uh, well, I had two or three things that happened that I would say the most important. One man was in the act of committing suicide, and I made some nutty statement about something. And I got to meet six months later, and I didn't know him, never heard of him, but I met him and his wife, and uh, he was, had taken 12 pills with 24 more in his hand with his morning coffee. And uh, she said that little incident completely touched him and turned his life. And he, he became a, new, a different person. And I had several things like that happen. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So I had, I had several things like that happen. And so that would be the most miraculous as a result of the years there and so forth. Uh, you know, I got to be on the old TV show, Hee Haw, and some things like that. The 50th anniversary, they had a big to do here. And the United States government declared October the 7th, 1956, as Henry Fulcher Day in America, and they flew the flag over the Pentagon in my name and uh, brought it to me. And Virginia did the same thing, and so did Farmville. So I had the flag folded there. But the greatest thing about it all is that I love people, and that's more important to me. Like sitting here talking to you right now. That's much more. You can touch all the plaques you want, and they'll be cold. You know, uh, a person uh, who comes up like a little lady on the street and said, you know, you made my day. You know, so and so. And that's more important than any of the other things that happen. Today, would you like to add anything more to the story? No, I don't think so. I think you covered it very well. You told me John Wilson hired you twice. Yeah, he did. <laughs> I um, I I had um, come from um, um, gotten gotten home from. My husband was in service, and, and I had gone with him, and we were living in um, Ohio. What? Ohio. Oh, Ohio. <laughs> I, I forgot. Um, and so we were just coming home, and um, I got settled in, you know, and, and we were eating dinner one um, night, and uh, John comes walking up to the door. And um, he said, um, <clears throat> so he came in and he sat down at the table with us. And uh, he said, um, I, I want you to come back to work. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that because now I have a 
um, a little baby, that a little girl that I want to take care of, and I want to stay there, stay home and take care of her. And he said, I, I think you need to come to work. Uh, he said, um, if you will come to work for me now, I will let you, if you, um, any time that this child needs you to, to stay home with her, you can do it and, and just let me know. And so after a while, I thought about it and I went back to work. That was a nice, that was a nice job too, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. She was a very good worker, I can tell you that. Francis, would you like to say anything in closing? Um, yeah, we appreciate you coming tonight. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed it. Uh, well, Miss Keys died some weeks before I got there, so I never met her. So this is all good history for me now. These people, I've heard of them and heard stories about John, John Wilson, actually hired me. And so a few years ago, he brought in my resume that I had uh, sent him. And uh, it was kind of fun to look at what I'd written down and everything. I'd been at the station in Lawrenceville, WLES, for two years. I was 16. And uh, so anyway, I came straight to Farmville, never missed a beat, went from that station on here the next 50 years. And uh, so I, I, when he brought that thing in, I said, well, uh, you know, if I remember right, that day you were going down to Virginia Beach to the VAB meeting, and you were going to listen to me on the air live. And he said, that's right. I said, well, it must have impressed you. And he said, no, not really. <laughs> I just needed a kid to, to be on the air in the afternoon. <laughs>